Well, good evening, family and friends. I praise God for you and I thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to, as, as you know, we are still starting through First Peter and now today we get into chapter 4. So I invite you to open your Bible together with me and let's read the first six verses in this chapter. So First Peter chapter 4 and this is what it says from verse 1 to 6. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Verse 3 says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, which are living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malignate you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. Why? that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the reading of your Word, and we thank you for just now. But I pray as we study your Word, as we learn together that you're glorified in it. Speak to us even here and now. All for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, now, if you followed last uh, Thursday's message which was of course the end of chapter 3 then you know that we were looking at defending the gospel the question then was are you prepared are you ready to defend the gospel are you prepared uh, to defend the gospel and we saw that if we're going to defend the gospel if we're going to defend our faith uh, so to speak we won we don't need to be afraid of suffering right don't be afraid of suffering if you're going to defend the gospel the other second thing we saw was you need to be willing to honor Christ in your heart let it be your passion your desire that you're living for Christ we also saw that we always have to be prepared to defend the gospel that at, at all times we are ready for it and and not just I'm ready today and then tomorrow I'm not prepared and tomorrow I can't answer and give a response to someone and and of course we say that we look to Jesus for example and and for encouragement if you're feeling discouraged you're feeling like you can you look to Christ who is on our example and we remember our own salvation if you're going to defend the gospel you're going to present the gospel to others remember your salvation remember what God did for you and then that motivates and encourages you to go and present the gospel to others so, so that's what we saw last last week if we're going to defend the gospel these are the things that at least we need to be doing now today as as we continue with these passages in chapter 4 Peter gets into the, the mind of Christ and so the title for today is thinking like Christ right thinking like Christ now he, he spent a great deal of, of time and verses talking about suffering talking about doing the right thing right from chapter 2 chapter 2 and the entire chapter 3 he talks about doing the right thing as we live in this world as we live under leadership we don't know God as we minister and serve among those who don't know Christ as we journey and walk through this world with uh, and interacting with those who don't know God how do we live how do we conduct ourselves among them and of course it says that one of the things is said in chapter 3 says be prepared always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who is going to ask you for the reason for the hope in you and it says and yet this is how you do it do it in gentleness in humility in calmness and you know trusting God so it gets into this since there are four now he, he kind of what, what Peter is now doing he is bring a connection of what he's spoken about suffering what we saw last week about defending the gospel defending our faith in the midst of suffering with all willingness with all boldness it says now this is what should happen 
since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Look at what it says. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So how do we think like Christ? The question is, do you think like Christ? You might say, well, I, I do or I don't know what that means. And this verses we've just read is going to help us know what it means to think like Christ. One, if we're going to think like Christ, uh, which, which is what Peter calls us to, says, I'm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Same way of thinking, just like Jesus Christ, because it says, Therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. You yourselves think the same way. How? Think like Christ did. And, and so this is the first place. How are we going to think like Christ? One, we think like Christ, and to think like Christ means, one, that we view suffering from God's perspective. We view suffering from God's point of view, the way God sees it. And that's how Christ lived his life. You see, when you study the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, you read the gospel throughout, you're going to see the different things that Jesus Christ went through. The persecution, the suffering, the rejection, and all that was directed towards preventing his ministry that laid and ended up in death. Right? So Jesus Christ went through all of these oppositions and, and rejections and denials and, and one after another, betrayal, all through to the end of his ministry leading to death. But why did Jesus Christ continue? Why did he continue doing ministry? Why did he continue serving? Why did he continue on this path? It's because for Jesus Christ, his eyes was fixed on the Father. His eyes was fixed on what God had sent him to do and what he was and the mission. That, that's what helped him. And so for him, if the suffering that he was facing was how God's ministry, God's mission and God's purpose for his life was going to be fulfilled, he was okay with it. If the suffering coming was because of ministry, he was okay with it. If the suffering coming was going to fulfill God's purpose, he was okay with it. Why was Jesus Christ willing and able to keep that? Keep that in mind. It's because he was seeing things from God's point of view. He knew God has got this. Yes, the suffering may come. Yes, this may happen. But God has got this and I'm going to trust Him. So it says, you yourself think like that. Now remember we spoke about suffering in, in the previous chapter. And, and Peter says suffering will come for doing the right thing. Suffering will come for preaching the gospel. And even in, in, in what we saw last week, he says, Now who is there to arm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer, he says, even if you should suffer for doing good for the sake of righteousness, let it be so because you'll be blessed. Because God, if God allowed it, if it's because of the things of God, he says God will still keep you, God will still guide you, God will lead you through that. So he says, now think like Christ. How do we do that? View suffering the way God sees it. View suffering the way Christ saw it. Christ did not allow suffering that he faced stop him or prevent him from doing the right thing. And you see, he humbled himself. Philippians says in chapter 2, Paul says to believers in Philippi, he says, have this mind, I can't read there, he says, have this mind among yourself, which is yours, where yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, did not consider that as equality, but he did something, he humbled himself, taking the form of a human and a servant, and he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For Christ Jesus the mission of God was it. And so, if the suffering was coming for being in God's mission, he was okay with it. We need to have the same mind, but also part of it is knowing that suffering might come for doing the right thing. Suffering might come for preaching the truth. Suffering might come for saying no to sin and evil and the way of life that others have. The second thing that it tells us is here. 
that that we see if we're going to think like Christ. Thinking like Christ means we treat sin the way God treats it. So he continues, Peter continues. So he says, arm yourselves the same way of, in the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, look, look at, you see, for God, sin is sin. You see, God, before God, every sin is sin, right? Now, we are the one who says, ah, no, I, I, it was just this. It's small. It was not big. It was not like the other one. Now, the truth is, sin is sin before God, right? Sin is sin. Now, every sin needs to be repented of. So that is forgiven. We need to bring it before God. We don't need to ignore it. We don't need to conceal it. We don't need to cover it. We don't need to pretend it's not there. If there is, we deal with it. We deal with it. We present it to God. That's why John writes, if we confess our sins unto Him, if we confess, if we acknowledge, is the word, if we acknowledge that we are sinful, that what we did was wrong, whether it was a thought, a behavior, a reaction, a response, or something that was wrong before God, He says we do what? We repent of it. If we, so we need to be willing to, if we repent, because there's a promise, if we are willing to, if we are willing to view sin the way God views it and bring it to Him so to deal with it, He says He's faithful and just to forgive us of the sin. And He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, how do we think like Christ? We view sin the way God treats it. We view sin the way Christ saw it. Sin was so bad, so deadly, that Christ wanted to deal with it. And He gave His life to deal with it. That that's how bad, how deadly sin is. Jesus Christ gave His life for it. For us so because of our sin. Right? So, if Jesus Christ died for our sin, we should not take it lightly. We should not play with it. So how do we think like Christ? We treat sin the way God sees it. We treat sin the way Jesus Christ treated sin. He saw the problem of sin. He saw the damage sin had brought. He saw the future ruin, life destroyed by sin. And he wanted to put an end to it. And he did. Even though he knew that it would cost him his life. And so in this passage, Peter is saying, we need to respond to sin that way. We, so literally what he's saying is, it's better we die for the truth than live in sin and for sin. That's what he's saying. It's better we die if the persecution, if the suffering is going to lead to death. Because you're standing for the truth, because you're preaching the gospel, because you've made up your mind to do the right thing. So it's better that way. Than to live in sin, to please it, to condone it, to embrace it. You see, the world today has people, including in churches, that have embraced so much evil, so much sinfulness and wickedness, unspeakable things that God has even clearly spoken against. And we've embraced it, we have allowed it. We're condoning it or we're practicing and living it. To think like Christ means we treat sin as God treats it. But the third thing is to think like Christ means we live our lives for God, not for ourselves. I want to say that again. To think like Christ, the third point, to think like Christ means we live our lives for God not for ourselves. So, he says in verse 2, so why do we arm ourselves with this way of thinking just like Christ? For whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Right, okay. So as to, so as to leave the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So as to leave, why do we need to deal with sin? Why do we need to view sin the way God does and respond to it in the same way? So that we live our lives 
for God. So that we live the rest of our lives for God, not for self. And so how do we think like Christ? By living our lives for God and not for self. And that's, that, that was all about Jesus' ministry. Jesus Christ was always about the mission of God, about the things of God, about the Word of God. <coughs> Excuse me, about the Word of God. And constantly he would say, What I do is the will of my Father. As the Father sent me, I sent you. What my Father said, I do. He was always about the Father. He did not leave his life. He did not leave his mission. It was not his own. It was the things of God. It was the mission of God. It was the purpose of God. It was the desires and the will of God. Jesus Christ was always in the will of the Father. He lived his life for the Father, not for himself, not for others, not, not for, for self and things like that. It was always for God. And we need to be the same. If we're going to think like Christ, that we need to know and decide in our own minds, in our own hearts, that we are going to live for God and not live for ourselves, that we are making up our mind, that we're seeking the will of God and living in the will of God, not in our own will, not in our own self, not what pleases us, not what makes us happy, but the things of God. Difficult that it might seem sometimes. Because that's the only thing that brings about joy and fulfillment and it glorifies Him. So, He says, So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passion, but for the will of God. So when sin is dealt with, when we are willing to surrender, confess, and bring it to the cross, and God deals with it. There's this newness that is brought, so that as we live the remaining life, time of our life, days that we have here on earth, in this body, it's not for the flesh anymore. It's not for what we used to live it in anymore. It's not for my own desires and passion anymore. It's now for God. It's for the things of God. It's for the mission of God. And it's until the mission of God becomes our mission. It's until we are shocked in the will of God and we filled with this desire to live for the things of God. Our life will not change. You say, so as to leave the rest of the time we have. Why? For the things of God, for the will of God. The first thing that we see that gives us, guides us in knowing how to think like Christ is thinking like Christ means we live differently from the non-believing world. Thinking like Christ, fourth one, means Living a life different from the non-believing world. So look at what it says. For the time that is past suffices the things that the Gentiles want to do. So now in scripture, the, the word Gentiles uh, sometimes is used in reference to non-believers. Of course, the time is used to, to make reference to non-Jews. But it, more so, its context and usage is meaning those who are not in Christ, those who are not saved yet. And, and so this is what it says, talking about non-believers. For in the time past, these are things that the non-believers want to do. The one I'm saying, the non-believing world, says this is what they want to do. They want to live in sensuality, the things that please them, in passion, drunkenness. Look at that. Orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Says this is what the non-believing world want to be. This is the kind of life they're living. It says, but that's not the life that is surrendered to Christ. A life that is surrendered to Christ is different. It looks different. Those who are not in Christ couldn't even tell that these ones are not one of us. These ones belong to God. Their life is different. So he says, for the time that is past, suffice it that what the Gentiles want to do, and this is what they want to do, living in sensuality, in passion, in drunkenness, in orgies, drinking purity, and lawlessness, with respect to these things, you say something happens. Look at what it says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same blood of debauchery. And so they malign you, so they abuse you, so they persecute you, so they reject you, so they deny you, so they don't want to associate with you, so they give you all of these names. To think like Christ 
needs to live life, lives that are different from the non-believing world. Why is that? Because we are living for God. That's why the, the third point is very important that we live our lives not for ourselves, but we live for God. We live lives not for self, but for God. And if we're living for God when we're sold out into seeking the will of God and living it out, then you know that the way you're living, the things you're doing, and everything in between is not going to be like the non-believing world. It's not going, you are not going to be found in, in, in lawless idolatry, in drunkenness, in orgies, in drinking parties, in sensuality, in all of these things mentioned in Scripture. You're not going to be there. You're going to be in the things of God. And because it's the things of God, the world does not know it. The world does not want it the world rejects it and he says that is why verse 4 says with respect to this respect to what with respect to the fact that the non-believers enjoy living in sensuality living in passion drunkenness urges drinking parties and lawlessness with respect to this and yet those who belong to God have closed their themselves with this same thinking that is found in Christ that they're viewing sin the way God views it that they're living their lives not for themselves but for God he says because of this that is why look at what he says in verse 4 with respect to this that's why one the non-believers get surprised when you don't join them in idolatry. They get surprised when you don't join them in their drunkenness. They get surprised when you don't join them in drinking parties. They get surprised when you don't join them and partake in sensuality and all of these things. He says that's why they get surprised. Why do they get surprised? Because you have something that they don't. Because in you live a power, a being that they don't have. The Spirit of God resides in you and they don't know that. They have not experienced the things that you have experienced in Christ. He says, that's why. So he says, to literally, this is what Peter is saying. Don't be surprised at how the non-believing world treats you. The reason they treat you that way, the, way, the reason they respond to you that way, is because they don't know you. They don't have what you have. They're still in the world. And he says also, they're surprised when you don't join them. In the same flood, you look at, you look at this keyword there, say, they're surprised when you don't join them in the same. You see, they expect you to live like them, but you're not. And it says, and that's also why they malate you, they abuse you, they reject you, they treat you and toss you here and there. Because you're not one of them. You see, to think like Christ we live lives that are different from the non-believing world. When you study the life of Jesus Christ in the gospel again, you see that Jesus Christ dealt with and lived his life against the no. The things that the people embraced and, and accepted and said this was okay, those were the things that Jesus Christ was not about. For, for example, during his time, the Pharisees and Sadducees had made it about if you're not a wealthy guy, if you're not a rich person, if you're not from a known family, then you're not worth. You don't qualify. You're not loved by God. And then you see Jesus Christ comes and in his ministry, as he's serving, as he's teaching, he's with, with, with the poor, with the sick, with the lame, with, with those who are rejected and outcast. Because that was the same. People that God has sent His Son for. Those people were also the people of God. And they were like, what in the world? What kind of Messiah is this guy? He sits with them, with tax collectors and sinners. You see, Jesus Christ lived this life for God. And so the things He did, the way He lived, the ministry He did, and how He conducted Himself was against the gnome. The, the rest of the Pharisees and the rest of the people who rejected Christ were thinking from the world's point of view. They were surprised that Jesus Christ did not join them. They were surprised that Jesus Christ could not support what they were doing. And why was that? Because Christ was about the mission of God and they were thinking from the world's point of view. We need to be like that. If we're going to think like Christ, that's what should define us. And then lastly, thinking like Christ means we live in awareness of God's coming judgment.
So we read the remaining verses. Verse 5. Let me read verse 4 just to connect to verse 5 and 6. So it says, With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. They malignate you. But they will, look at what it says, but they will give account to him, who God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judging the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So it says now, remember as he's talking about the gospel preached to those who are dead, he's dealing meaning those who already died. They, they heard the gospel back then. They suffered, they lived for it, they were killed for it. And it says, if now at, at our point, at our vantage point as we speak, we have so many lists of people to give. First of all, all the apostles died. Then you, then you come to the, peop, the peer of the reformers. Those, have got, those people have died. And we, we know very many solid men and women who live for God who die. For the truth. It says those same people heard the gospel. They lived it and died for the truth. It says the reason why the gospel is preached. Even to those guys who now are dead. Is because there's only one judge. Who's going to judge both the living and the dead. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said don't be afraid of people who can only kill your body. He says, be afraid of he who has the power. Both to destroy this body. And also your soul. God. So how do we think like Christ? We live. Thinking like Christ means we live our lives. In awareness of God's coming judgment. Because we know. Judgment is coming. We know. That there is no hope. Besides Jesus Christ. That we know that it's this life that we have. That once someone is dead, there's no more second chance. Once they're gone. For it's appointed for man to die. And the next thing is judgment. We live in that awareness. That's why we think like Christ. That's why we need to live for the gospel. That's why you remember from last week's sermon. We need to defend the gospel at our old times. Because... The souls of men and women is at stake. If they miss hearing the gospel today and the, their life is gone, there's no hope. Let us preach Christ and Christ crucified. Let us proclaim the gospel. Let us not be afraid of suffering for the truth. Look at what he says. He says, these people, though they were judged in the flesh, though they were judged and persecuted and killed in the flesh for the gospel, they're still alive. And what Peter is saying is, death is not the end for a believer. Yes, they might persecute you. Yes, they might even kill you for the truth. But them killing you is not the end. They will not destroy you. They will just destroy this body. But death for a believer is just a transition from this life here on earth in this temporary body into the presence of God to live for eternity. So he says the reason why the gospel is preached even to those who were judged, those who were killed for the gospel. He says those people knew the reason why they stood their ground. They gave their life for the truth. He says they knew even though they would die, they'll remain, their life would still live on in the presence of God. That death for a believer is just a transition from this world into the presence of God where we'll forever live with the one who sits on the throne. Don't be afraid. Think like Christ. I want to just review what does it mean to think like Christ. To think like Christ means we'll live in, and view suffering the way God views it. Secondly, we treat sin as God treats it. Thirdly, we live our lives for God and not for ourselves. The fourth thing, we live our lives so differently in this world that the non-believing world knows it and can attest to it. And the last thing is, we live our lives in awareness of God's judgment. And, and because of that, that motivates us, that reminds us that we have work to do because judgment is coming. And if they don't know God, if, if we don't know Him in this life, there's no hope for them in the next. But I want to encourage you. We're living in a world and a time where the truth is not popular. The Word of God is not popular. People are rejecting it. People are throwing it away. Let us stand for truth. 
And yes, persecution might come. Yes, you might suffer for it. But don't quit. Don't give up. Remember this, that the souls of men and women is at stake. And they need to hear the gospel, the gospel of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Let us go and live for God. Proclaim Christ and Christ crucified. God bless you. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the grace you've given to us. Help us think like you. Help us have this mind which is yours in Christ. A mind that is not selfish, that does not think about me but others, that not just think about my comfort but the gospel, that is not living for myself but for you. Help all of us live in this awareness that the souls of men, the souls of women, boys and girls, young and old, is a stake. And that every single day that we keep quiet without proclaiming the truth is a day that someone is getting closer to their grave, closer to eternal separation with you. May that give us urgency, willingness to proclaim Christ and Christ crucified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you, if you don't know Christ, if you've not believed in Him, Please do say a prayer, invite Him to be your Lord and Savior, acknowledge Him that He died for you and start a new life in Christ. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.